So in this video, we're going to review the cellular respiration lab. We're going to be using the old protocol from the 2001 lab manual, but it's really not that different from the protocol in the new manual. We're going to be trying to measure the rate of an organism's cellular respiration. Um, and then once we can determine that rate, we want to see how various factors might affect how fast an organism respires. So how can we measure the rate of respiration? Well, we can do potentially several things. We could see how much oxygen they take in, because that's a reactant. We could also try to measure uh, one of the byproducts, uh, carbon dioxide. Or we might even be able to, to measure the temperature change that occurs if we had some way of measuring heat. Um, we're ultimately going to do the first one. We're going to try and measure the rate at which they consume um, oxygen gas. And remember that a rate is going to be with a unit of time. So ultimately, we're going to report our rates as sort of the milliliters of oxygen gas consumed per minute. Remember that per means divided by, essentially. So this is another way of reporting those units, milliliters of oxygen consumed per minute. That's ultimately going to be our, our interest, is calculating that rate and seeing what factors do to that rate. Um, so the first thing we need to do if we're going to measure how much gas an, uh, an organism takes in, then we're going to need a way of limiting how much gas they have access to. If I just sort of took an organism and put them in a laboratory environment exposed to air, they, they'd be taking in some of the oxygen around them, um, but it would just be replaced by all the air that's around them. So we're going to take our organisms, we're going to put them into sealed glass chambers, we're going to have a pipette attached to them with a certain amount of air in it, and then we're going to take that whole um, apparatus and sort of submerge it in a water bath horizontally to sort of trap a certain amount of air in that system. Um, then when they use that oxygen gas, we're hoping to show, this is kind of early in my experiment, you can see that I'm using food coloring here to um, uh, make it easier to see where the water stops and where the gas um, begins. So maybe this is early in, in my version of the experiment, and then here's later on. Notice the middle one change especially. Um, the middle one changes quite a bit as it takes in that clear oxygen gas that's left in the tube. So as the organisms use oxygen gas, the water should fill in to replace it. Um, sometimes I get a question early on from students. They want to know, um, why doesn't all the air just rush out of there as soon as we put it into the water bath? And the idea is that we're trapping it by placing it in horizontally. Um, for example, I have a beaker of water here, and I have a beaker of air. Um, if I put the beaker of air in sort of upside down, then the air still has volume in it, and it still um, is sort of trapped in there. It takes up space, and without anywhere to go, um, the, the water can't enter that beaker of air. Um, so that's effectively what we're trying to do here in this um, lab as well. We're just kind of putting it in horizontally instead of uh, directly upside down. Um, but by trapping the air and giving these organisms a limited amount of air, then we can see exactly how much of it they're going to use. So we need to think about why the volume actually decreases because we potentially have a problem here. The problem is that for every six molecules of oxygen that are taken in, uh, six molecules of carbon dioxide are actually produced in cellular respiration. So if we didn't do something about that uh, carbon dioxide product, then as much gas would be taken in as produced, the overall volume of the air actually wouldn't change. Um, in this lab, we're going to um, get around that problem by using a chemical inside the glass chamber, uh, potassium hydroxide. So I'm going to put potassium hydroxide pellets in the bottom of your chamber, and then I'm going to go ahead and cover it with a, a layer of non-absorbent cotton. You don't have to worry about that, and I, I just don't want you touching the potassium hydroxide because it's a very strong base. Uh, but the purpose here is that the, the potassium hydroxide can actually combine with any of the carbon dioxide that the organisms produce. And for our purposes, we don't need to memorize this equation, but the important part is here. Um, this is actually potassium carbonate, which I don't really care about the name of it. What I care about is that it's, it's a solid. And so essentially what the reaction will do is it will pull the carbon dioxide gas out of the chamber as it's being produced and, and keep it as a very compact solid. Therefore, the only volume that should be changing, uh, or the overall air's volume will change because the oxygen gas will be decreasing. Okay. 
So um, let's just talk briefly about reading the pipettes correctly because um, usually I have some problems with groups every year who read it incorrectly. Um, it might be a little hard to see from the digital photograph I took here. I tried to zoom in as good as I could. Um, please notice that these big numbers here are actually in the tenths. Um, you can kind of see that little dot um, right by the six. That's actually 0.6. And then um, 10 marks later, it's 0.7. So that means each of the big marks is one tenth of a milliliter. And that makes each one of these little marks then a one one hundredth of a milliliter. So please do not report to me that your, your organisms consumed 7.2 milliliters of gas. Um, that would be incredible, given that the entire pipette is actually only um, uh, one milliliter. Um, so um, uh, please do your readings carefully. The other thing that students can do sometimes is that you need to be careful how you look down this pipette. Um, I'm, uh, the, the glass chamber would actually be down here from this perspective, so if you kind of look at it, um, looking towards the tip, um, you'd be looking at it kind of the best way, in my opinion, because you would remind yourself that the numbers are increasing as you look up. So in other words, this little watermark is hitting right here where it hits the gas, and that looks to me like it's right around 0.72 milliliters. Um, I've had some groups kind of report that as 0.88 before. Sometimes if you sort of look the other direction, it looks like, you know, here's 0.8, and so this would be 0.81, and so I think this is 0.88. Um, please make sure you're looking at the pipette and reading it carefully with your group so that you, you collect accurate data. Okay, so some other things that we need to think about. We want to hold the volume of total stuff inside each chamber constant. So if we're going to, say, compare species or we're going to compare different types of, of living organisms, then we want to make sure that if some of the organisms are just bigger than other organisms, we want to compensate for that by adding glass beads to make the overall volume of solids inside constant. And you might ask, why should we care about that? Well, the idea here is that if we um, have, say, one of our glass chambers is full of organisms, then there's very little air space left over in there. And so most of the air is going to be in the pipette that's attached. Whereas if we have another group that takes up very little space by themselves, they have a tremendous amount of air, extra air, in that chamber if we don't add glass beads. And so it might look like they're respiring very slowly, but they might just be taking all the air out of the glass chamber before they start taking the air out of the pipette. So we want to hold all that constant by filling them with the same amount of solids. So how do we do that? Um, the protocol just calls for using the volume by displacement method. Fill a graduated cylinder with some water. Note how much water is in there. Add your solids. Um, the solids will push the water up a certain extent. You can find the difference between those, and that's the volume of your solids. You might want to put your biggest um, uh, stuff in there first and see how much volume they occupy. Then you can go back and fill it with the smaller um, organisms and add glass beads until you get the same volume of solids. So the idea is that when you fill your glass chambers, they should generally look like they're filled with the same amount of stuff. Um, they might not look exactly the same because your smaller objects will take up a little, a little less space, but imagine that there's a lot of air kind of inside um, uh, the bigger objects too, and so if you, if you use the graduated cylinder approach and you do a careful job, you'll be just fine. So I tested three groups in my little experiment. I tested germinated uh, peas, um, dormant dry peas with some glass, glass beads added, and a glass beads only group that we're going to need to talk about here shortly. The glass beads group is really important because if we're trying to measure the uh, gas volume change due to cellular respiration, the challenge that we face is that the volume of a gas might change for several reasons. So we need to go back to chemistry a little bit here and go back to our uh, formula Pivnert. Um, we learned that uh, the volume of a gas might change due to several factors. What we're really hoping in this lab is that cellular respiration decreases the amount of oxygen gas that's there. So that'd be like a decrease in N, the number of moles of oxygen gas. And when N decreases on the right side of this equation, the volume will decrease correspondingly on the left side of the equation. That's what we're really hoping happens um, to cause volume change. 
Um, R is obviously just a constant, so that's not going to um, change at all. But the idea here is that temperature changes and pressure changes can also cause volume changes. And so if um, probably air pressure isn't going to change very much unless um, you know, there were to be like a hurricane approaching our area while we run lab, which is pretty unlikely. Um, so probably air pressure changes aren't going to be significant over the, the 30 minutes we're going to run this lab. But the temperature of your water bath certainly could change, especially if your group eventually decides to test how different temperatures affect respiration rate. Um, it's very hard to keep the water bath at a uniform constant temperature the entire time. So let's say your group kind of adds some hot water to make your water bath a little warmer in temperature, but then over the course of your experiment, maybe the um, temperature of your water bath starts to drop um, as um, it cools back down to room temperature, then that in of itself could cause the volume of your gas to drop, and that would not be volume change due to respiration. It would just be because your water bath's cooling down. So the idea of the glass beads only group is if we can't hold pressure and temperature perfectly constant throughout the lab, what we can do is we can put that group in with our other living organisms as a group to take measurements on. And any time the volume changes in this glass beads only group, glass beads obviously are not living organisms. They're not doing respiration. So what they'll do is they'll detect any gas volume change that occurs due to something else besides respiration. And then we can just subtract out any change that occurs in that group. So we're going to be calculating something called corrected difference. And I'm going to have um, some examples of that um, coming up here in just a minute. OK, so just a few other reminders. Even though we have the glass beads only group, your lab recommends that once you fill your chambers with the same volume of solids, um, you want to put all of your chambers into the water bath, um, but maybe leave the pipette sticking out for about seven minutes. So they recommend you create a little masking tape sling. Um, and what are we trying to do here? Well, we're trying to get the, the air inside of your glass chamber equilibrated to the temperature of your water bath. Um, if you don't do this, you might get wild changes that occur early in your readings, and that's just because the air in your chambers are getting used to the new temperature. So go ahead and equilibrate for seven minutes here. Then they recommend that you um, uh, put your pipettes in and kind of let it equilibrate for three more minutes. Remember that your pipettes have been sticking out this whole time, so they have not equilibrated. Um, and then once you wait those three minutes, then you can finally start taking measurements um, um, for your actual lab. So a lot of carefulness, um, uh, a lot of careful consideration going into the procedure here. Make sure you realize what you're doing and why. So let's just finish this up by showing you some sample data. Um, some things that we will want you to do here is we'll want you to always calculate a cumulative change. In other words, whatever reading you take at time zero once your temperature equilibrations have finished, um, always subtract that initial reading from any subsequent readings. So how much um, gas volume changed over the first three minutes? We could subtract 0.9 from 0.82. Um, we're going to call that uh, uh, that direction the positive direction. So always do initial minus whatever time you're testing. So after six minutes, the P's would change um, from 0.9 to 0.72. That would be a positive 0.18 milliliters of volume change. We could do the same thing for our glass beads. Always subtract from time zero. So after three minutes, our glass beads change two hundredths of a milliliter in the positive direction. And after six minutes, they changed 0 .5, 0 0.05, or five hundredths of a milliliter in the positive direction. So again, what's the point of calculating the glass bead change? Well, that was changed due to factors other than respiration. So all we're encouraging you to do is we just want to subtract that out of our living organism's volume change. If it looked like the peas changed 8 hundredths of a of, of milliliter, well, the glass beads also changed 2 hundredths of a milliliter. So maybe two of those eight units were due to factors other than cellular respiration. So if we subtract that out, 0 0.08 minus 0 0.02, we'd get that the peas really did 6 hundredths of a milliliter worth of cellular respiration. 
If we also do it at six minutes, we would um, see um, 0 0.18 minus 0 0.05, and we'd see that the, the P's did overall um, 0.13 units, uh, uh, milliliters of respiration after six minutes. So um, the reason why I'm not showing you the rest is I would highly encourage you to pause the video here in a few seconds and see if you can calculate the rest before I show you the answers. Um, I am kind of playing a little bit of a trick on you toward the end here. Let's assume that the glass beads uh, up to six minutes kind of went in the positive direction. They decreased in volume, maybe because let's say that the, the group added ice to make it colder at first. Let's say at nine and 12 minutes though that the ice melted and the water bath is starting to warm back up. That's why we'd see what we see here in the glass bead readings. So why don't you see if you can calculate those. Um, go ahead and pause and we'll show you in just a second here. Okay, so here's what I got. Um, we see that as the water bath was warming back up at 9 and 12 minutes, we see that the gas volume is starting to go back up towards the 0.9 mark. Um, it's going up because temperature is increasing. That would increase our gas volume. So that's why it's, it appears as though this change is still barely positive here. And this change is actually a little negative down here. 0.87 minus 0 0.90 is actually a negative 0 0.03. So um, what's actually occurring there is, um, assuming our P's are doing the same thing in our water bath, it looks like they did 0.21 um, units of change, but when we subtract a negative 0 0.03, we're actually adding to it. So it, it looked like it went down 0.21, um, but it actually, um, the 0.21 accounts for 0 0.03 units of moving up, so it actually did 0.24 units of respiration. So why do we do the corrected difference? What I hope you can see is that if we just did the cumulative change without the glass beads group, this, um, this respiration rate looks very uneven and kind of crazy over the 12 minute interval. Um, but if we do the corrected difference, we see a much more regular rate of respiration. It looks like it's doing about 0.06 units of respiration every three minutes, which makes much more sense. All right, so what we did in this video is we tried to introduce the respiration lab. How are we measuring the respiration rate? How are we preventing other factors from impacting our results? We just want to measure the gas volume change due to cellular respiration alone. And then we tried to really justify the purpose of the glass beads only group and how they help us calculate something called corrected difference. And you want to make sure you're comfortable calculating that for this lab as well.